Thank you for turning out on this uh, beautiful sunny day. Uh, as some of you know, I'm Pat Thomas and I teach health and medical journalism here at the Grady College of Journalism and Mass Communication, now celebrating its 100th year. Um, this is the final lecture of the 10th annual Voices from the Vanguard series, which is a joint production of uh, the Center for Tropical and Emerging Global Diseases, whose director, Dan Colley, is sitting down here in the front. Uh, we really want to apologize for the abrupt cancellation of last month's talk by Dr. Sarah Schlesinger from Rockefeller. It was made necessary by a medical emergency in her immediate family, and I hope that none of you were left on the chapel steps like disappointed brides or grooms. Uh, tonight we have journalist and author uh, Marin McKenna, truly a star in the world of journalism and a highly respected uh, journalist among uh, scientists because she, uh, she gets it right. Uh, she's the author of two prize-winning books in 2004. She published a book about the, ep the disease detectives at the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention called Beating Back the Devil. Uh, and then in 2011, she uh, published Superbug, a book that you may know, which is about uh, the fatal menace of MRSA. Uh, this won the top award for the National Association of Science Writers, many other prizes, and earned her the fond nickname, Scary Disease Girl. Uh, last month, she spoke at TED in uh, Vancouver. Uh, she has led an adventurous life. Uh, I just stole a few lines from her website because I love this description. She is reported from a field hospital in New Orleans during Hurricane Katrina, a village on Thailand's west coast that was erased by the Indian Ocean tsunami, a CDC team investigating the anthrax letter attacks on Capitol Hill, a bird catching and testing unit during the first advance of West Nile virus, a graveyard within the Arctic Circle that held victims of the 1918 flu, a malaria hospital in Malawi, an isolation ward for multi-drug resistant TB in Vietnam, and a polio eradication team in India, and from quarantine stations, laboratories, sex clubs, and farms. It's an interesting juxtaposition. Most recently, she's been focusing on farms everywhere, and that's what she will talk to us about. So please welcome my friend and colleague, Maren McKenna. Thank you all for coming on this gorgeous day. And um, thank you, Pat, for that sterling introduction. Pat and I have known each other a long time. And she, though she would not say it, is in fact a star in our field. So to hear praise from her is a unique pleasure for me. Thank you to everyone at UGA for having me. And I, I warn you in advance, and I'm so sorry, um, I drove through the green cloud of pollen on the way here. <laughs> And I think it's getting into my throat. So if I have to stop and cough or swig water, um, I promise I'm, I'm, I, I don't think I'm hypoxic. I, I, it's just, it, it, anyway, I, I apologize. Um, so, so um, the story that I'm going to tell you, the story of antibiotics and agriculture, uh, which is a story that has been obsessing me for the past couple of years and is the subject of my new book, which won't be out for a year, so this is a sneak peek, um, is a story of unintended consequences, which is really sort of the best kind of story for a journalist to tell, because good intentions gone awry are much more interesting than, than people planning to do evil from the start. And when, when actions are created out of a sense of good intentions, they have a kind of moral propulsion behind them that makes them very difficult to dislodge um, as, as they roll out. So, so this is where we are. A couple of graphics to set the stage. I hope you can see these. This, this is a slightly complicated daisy. Um, comes from a British project called the Review on Antimicrobial Resistance. And it's a representation of the current public health burden of antibiotic resistance. Right now, across the world, 700,000 deaths a year more than cholera, measles, tetanus, and several other diseases combined. And that project predicts, the purple, that if we can't get this under control, there will be 10 million deaths a year from antibiotic resistance across the world by 2050. That's more deaths than cancer and significantly more than most other diseases of public health concern. 
what are the inputs, inputs that would create those deaths? They're represented in this chart, which comes from the Pew Charitable Trusts. It's a little hard to read, I think, from the distance you're looking at. But this is a data visualization covering just the United States of the usage of antibiotics in the United States in a single year. The data actually comes from 2011, but nothing is very different year to year. Um, there, the, the annual toll of antibiotic resistance in the United States is 23,000 deaths a year and about 2 million illnesses. Now, that lower line, the green line, shows the annual use of antibiotics and antimicrobials in humans, and the upper line is what's going on in animals. The antibiotic use in humans, 7.7 .7 million pounds. The antibiotic use in animals, 29.9 .9 million pounds, or about a ratio of four to one. So here's why that's interesting. In human medicine, we try to use antibiotics conservatively. We ask people that they only take antibiotics if they have a bacterial illness. We ask them that they wait to find out if the antibiotic is the correct one for their illness. We ask them not to take antibiotics if they're not sick. The vast majority of those antimicrobials being used in animals, that 29.9 .9 million pounds, by definition, are going to animals that are not sick. They're going into them either for what's called growth promotion, which is encouraging them to put tasty muscle on faster, or they're going for what's called prophylaxis or metaphylaxis, which is protecting them from the conditions that they're held in. But they're not, for the most part, actually being used to treat disease. That usage almost certainly has contributed to the serious situation of antibiotic resistance that we find ourselves in now. And to explain how we got to this, I have to take you back to this, which represents the beginning of the antibiotic era. So a little bit of history. The antibiotic era really sort of begins in 1928, when Alexander Fleming, supposedly the story goes, leaves a, a window open in his laboratory in London. Something blows in across his culture plates. And when he goes to clean and reuse them two weeks later, because they're glass, there are no plastics yet, he needs them fairly quickly, he discovers that on the staff that he has been growing, there are, there's a polka dot pattern of death, zones of exclusion, caused by something secreted at the middle of each of those polka dots. And what's at the middle of the polka dots is penicillium mold, which expresses the first raw compound natural penicillin. Penicillin doesn't become a drug until 1940. Um, it's, it's given experimentally in 1941. It's rolled out on the battlefields of World War II. This is a poster about penicillin being given on the battlefields in 1943. It's released to the general public for sale in 1944. Um, in 1945, Fleming and his collaborators win the Nobel Prize in medicine. And in his speech accepting the prize, he actually warns that people are going to waste this drug that has changed the world. People who are given penicillin, who would previously have died long, lingering, really horrible deaths from infection, are now recovering in days. Nothing like that has been seen before. It's why they start to call them the miracle drugs. And Fleming says, if we overuse these, if we underdose, if we overdose, we're going to use them up. So penicillin is so successful as a product, in addition to as a treatment, that lots of other companies want to get in on the act. And so penicillin in 1944, streptomycin in 1944, and Oreomycin, what we now call chlortetracycline, the first of the tetracyclines, in 1948. Those drugs start the antibiotic era that we're still living in today. In fact, all of us here in this room were born within the antibiotic era. Unless you heard from your parents, grandparents, great-grandparents, we don't really know what it's like to, to be so vulnerable to infection that if we get a cut or a scratch or a contusion, we would be expected to die of it. But we might soon know what that's like again. So it's important to keep in mind, I think, that the shock of antibiotics arriving is not just the shock of people suddenly recovering in that very rapid manner. Other things are going on in World War II besides soldiers being saved on the battlefield. That is that the war changes our diets pretty permanently. The effort to feed all the soldiers out on the battlefields causes a massive ramp up in meat production. In just one example, Hormel, the people who make Spam, um, 
they double their production of spam in three years to the point where they're using, at, at the end of that three years, 1.6 million hogs a year, which would not seem like much these days, but was an extraordinary amount then, because what we think of as concentrated intensive agriculture really didn't exist at that point. Now, that guaranteed market for meat, the, the, the need to, the pressure to ramp up infrastructure to produce more meat, only lasts as long as the war does. And when the war ends and the government stops buying all that meat that that new infrastructure has been bought for, suddenly there's enormous pressure to reduce costs in livestock production because there's all this infrastructure and not very much buying. There's a lot of supply and not much demand. At the same time, the global food supply starts to seem unexpectedly fragile. In Europe and Asia, there are crop failures in 1945 and again in 1947. And in the United States, in 1946, there's a, an interruption in the supply of meat, not so much a problem of animal health as a problem of delivery. And in the 1946 elections, people talk about there being a meat famine. So there are these two contradictory impulses of, on the one hand, there's an overcapacity, and on the other hand, there's a sense of fragility and uncertainty. But both of those contribute to a desire to produce meat much less expensively. And producers turn to less nutritious foods in order to save money. And out of that, or into that, walks this guy. His name is Thomas Jukes. He was a biochemist. He worked at uh, what we now think of as a Beltway Bandit, a corporation that benefited from the war called American Cyanamid. And within American Cyanamid, he worked for a science group called Letterly Laboratories. Now, Letterly had produced the first tetracycline, oreomycin. And Jukes was actually an expert from the University of California in the nutrition of chickens. And he had spent the previous 10 years of his career trying to figure out what were chickens vitamin needs. What did you need to do to put into poultry feed in order to keep animals healthy? And when this pressure came along to produce meat more cheaply, Letterly asked Jukes to start looking at what could they put in chicken feed that would, would shore up that cheaper feed that producers were now being forced to buy. So he set up a little experiment. He took a whole bunch of um, of small groups of newly hatched chicks, and he assigned them to different diets, to a control diet, just their normal diet, to diets that had a variety of additives, liver extract, distillers grains, brewers yeast, and they added to one of the diets the leftovers from the making of oreomycin, that tetracycline that Letterly was making in another laboratory. They did this at the time because they were looking for what they, at the time, they called an animal protein factor, something that, that's very shorthand for, repro for replacing the protein that these animals would otherwise need. Now, it turned out several years later that the animal protein factor was actually the vitamin B12, and that turns into sort of a dead end in this story. The, the important thing that happens is that on Christmas Day, 1948, Jukes has given his lab assistant the holiday off. He goes to Letterly to check on his experimental chicks. And he walks into his lab, and he weighs each of the groups of chicks that are each getting a different diet. And the chicks that weigh the most are the chicks that got the antibiotic leftovers, the, the dried grains and leftover brine that oreomycin had been brewed in. And when he does that, he changes the world. It turns out that what they've given the, the chicks is microdoses of oreomycin, tiny leftovers that are left in the grains that the antibiotic was brewed in and the brine that was drained off afterward. You have to understand that making an antibiotic is a lot like making beer. You take a carbohydrate, you inoculate it with an organism, you let it cook, and if you've done that with yeast, then what you get is alcohol and water, and if you've done it with a soil fungus, then what you get instead is a crude antibiotic. And you're left with the carbohydrate you brewed it in and the excess fluid. Jukes wrote, close to the end of his life, that the effect they got from this was so extraordinary that farmers all over the country began demanding it. 
that he in fact started getting phone calls from senators wanting to know why the farmers in the next state over were getting more tank cars of the brine from Oreo Meissen manufacturer than their own farmers were. And no one seems to have thought that this was a bad idea, <laughs> except possibly a few of the veterinarians at Letterly who spoke up to Jukes and his boss and said, maybe we should not be sending antibiotics out in this manner. But the, the, the desire to essentially make profit out of nothing, out of something that would otherwise have been discarded in this setting in which meat production was already becoming a fairly low margin, low profit endeavor for people at the producer level down at the farm, that all of that outweighed any of those concerns, such as the concerns that Fleming had voiced just at that point 10 years before. So they come to call those, those micro doses that they're giving the animals growth promoters because they make the animals get fat faster. And the FDA approves the use of growth promoters in 1951, and the United Kingdom's government follows in 1953. And for a really significant period of time, for almost a decade, everyone thinks this is a fantastic idea, that it's yet another one of the benefits of the miracle drugs of the antibiotic era, that in addition to curing these diseases that have bedeviled us for as long as we've been human, curing them essentially without side effects and very, very quickly, it's going to fix agriculture as well. So in 1951, they debate this in, um, in the British Parliament. Everyone says this is a great idea. The same happens with our own FDA. No one can see any downside to, uh, to using antibiotics in this manner. And then, then attitudes start to shift. It takes about 10 years. Um, starting at about the time this was being debated at the FDA, the University of Nottingham in England holds what they call an Easter school, which is effectively a, sort of an intensive boot camp during their spring break, the equivalent of spring break, in which they study the issue of antibiotics in agriculture. And they do this for many years. And in the early 1960s, people start to raise questions. This is just 10 years after the first discovery of growth promoters. People start to raise questions about whether this is really the smartest use or whether, whether we are exposing ourselves to potentially using up the effectiveness of antibiotics faster than we planned. And those early concerns are correct because from the 1960s, the world's first outbreaks of antibiotic resistant foodborne illness start to occur. Now, foodborne illness itself as, as a big outbreak thing is itself a relatively new phenomenon because it's only after World War II and really only after the, growth, the advent of growth promoters that we start to get really intensive concentrated agriculture as we know it now. 30,000 chickens on a chicken house floor. Um, so, so the idea that there are big outbreaks, not random point sources of foodborne illness is still kind of new. But then people drinking milk in England start to develop penicillin allergies because the dairy cows are getting so much penicillin. Cheesemakers complain that they can't make cheese anymore because there's so much drug in the milk that they're getting that it kills the bacteria that, that cause the, the milk to become cheese. In 1965, there's the first ever sighting of antibiotic resistant illness serious enough to kill people. Um, resistant salmonella infections linked to weaned calves that are being sent out for sale with little bags of antibiotics to be administered to them, tied around their throats. And then in 1967, there's a big outbreak in the north of England. More than 200 people sick, most of them children, 14 of them die. It's a scandal. And it's even though that's way in the north, it's covered all over the country. It's interesting that this is happening in England. And I'm going to hypothesize that the reason is because England is just smaller. And in most of England, especially at this point in the 1960s, agriculture and most of its towns and villages are really interpenetrated. I, I grew up in what was then a small town southwest of London. And you did not have to go very far outside the wall around my boarding school to find a farm. It's a little different now. But, but England is still a sufficiently small place that there are eyes on most of the farms most of the times. It's very different from here to where we have concentrated so much of our agriculture in places like the Midwest, 
like Duplin County, North Carolina, like in Northeast Georgia, pretty far away from the urban centers. So in England, they notice these effects emerging more quickly. And this guy here, Sandy Anderson, is a, a public health scientist, and he takes this up as a personal cause, that as a result of unfettered use of antibiotics in agriculture, things are starting to go bad in human health. That's a new thought. It, it had, if anyone had thought about this before, it was just that the drugs wouldn't work in animals any longer, that we, we would fairly quickly have run out of their effectiveness and this, this gorgeous thing of the growth promoters would, would be a gift that ceased to give. But that resistance could cross to people is a new and troubling thing. So he writes this up in the British Medical Journal, warning that there's going to be more antibiotic-resistant illness arising. And it becomes a serious enough concern in England that they actually charter a, a government examination of the use of antibiotics in agriculture, the first such examination anywhere in the world. Uh, it's a, they put together a committee. It's chaired by a man named Michael Swan, who's also the chair of the BBC, so he's quite important in British society. They take two years to study the evidence, and they come out with a finding that growth promoter use is a bad idea, that it is going to use up the effectiveness of antibiotics for animals, and that it is going to cause antibiotic-resistant illness that's going to cross off the farm and imperil people who have no relationship to agriculture. The Swan Report, as it's called after its chairman, not only recommends that growth promoters shouldn't be used anymore, but they make a bunch of other recommendations. And it's quite striking to read them now because they're things that we here in the United States are still grappling with as policy questions. They are things that are by no means concluded, like the Swan Committee says, we should restrict farm antibiotic use to ones that won't stimulate resistance to drugs that are important for human health. They say we should make animal antibiotics prescription only. For every use of an antibiotic, a veterinarian should be actively involved. They say the government should increase funding for surveillance and for publishing data about the occurrence of resistance. All of these things are, ex are proposed by the Swan Committee. Almost none of them actually get enacted. But there's enough buzz about it that the concern crosses the Atlantic and becomes an issue for our Food and Drug Administration. In 1970, they create a committee that does essentially the same thing the Swan Committee does, and in 1972 issues a report that says, we too think antibiotic growth promoters for meat animals is a bad idea, is an unnecessary risk of the power of antibiotics. And they recommend that growth promoter use be stopped. Now, the veterinary pharma industry, as Thomas Jukes discovered in 1948, has, has found this to be a very lucrative market because agriculture post-World War II has really expanded. And growth promoters and a sort of secondary use of antibiotics, prophylaxis or metaphylaxis, protecting animals from the conditions they're, they're held in, has become quite lucrative even though any one sale of these drugs is just a minuscule fee. It's, it's just not significant, but the volume is significant. So the industry, understandably from their point of view, starts to push back. And the FDA indicates to them that they might start thinking about withdrawing the licenses they granted in the 1950s, and the industry goes looking for someone to produce evidence on their side that this is not as hazardous as the FDA thinks. And they find this guy. Um, his name is Stuart Levy. He is a professor at Tufts University outside Boston. He is now the grand old man of antibiotic research in the United States, truly the dean. Um, but in 1976, he was a new researcher just out of, his, out of uh, his training. And a group that still exists today called the Animal Health Institute came to him and said, we would like you to construct an experiment that demonstrates that antibiotics used in farm animals are not, in fact, a risk to public health, that, they do not, that the resistance does not move to other animals, that it does not move off the farm, that it does not occur in people. And so Levy builds himself a little experimental farm on a property outside Boston. And he stocks that little farm, which has never had animals on it before, with chickens. And he, construct, asks, he constructs it in such a way that there are chicken pens where the chickens have no contact with each other. And he feeds one batch of chickens uh, a feed 
spiked with an E. coli that in turn has been spiked with a particular plasmid that he's not going to have any resistance trait, that he's not going to have any trouble identifying afterward. And then he comes back and he proves fairly quickly that that resistance is not only now resident in the chickens that received that feed, but that it's also shown up in chickens at the other end of the barn where there is no physical contact between the chickens, and that it's also in the human handlers. He knows this because he collects the feces of all the chickens and the human handlers once a week and tests them. And so this is not actually what the Animal Health Institute planned for him to discover. But what, what he has identified is the first randomized, controlled, prospective proof that antibiotics given to animals stimulate resistance that move to humans. And he takes that to the, F he publishes it, um, and he, uh, it's taken up by the FDA. And the FDA says, right, we really need to move on this. And this is what they do. In 1977, they publish in the Federal Register. This was published by the, the, the agency that was over the FDA at the time. It's now Health and Human Services. It was the Department of Health, Education, and Welfare. This is what's called a notice of an opportunity for a hearing, for short N-O-O-H in government acronyms. What the FDA planned to do was to say to the animal pharmaceutical industry, right, we've changed our minds. We think that this is not such a safe practice as we thought it was back in the 1950s. We would like you, manufacturers, to show up and show us evidence why we should not withdraw those licenses that we gave you in 1951 and 1953. And they never get to have that hearing because congressmen from the major agricultural states suggest to the FDA that this is not a good idea. And when the FDA doesn't listen, they are a bit more affirmative in their um, interference, and they, they order the FDA to not hold this hearing, but rather to conduct more research. And then they do that again. And then the Senate asks the same thing. And the ball of this hearing, this attempt to take away the approval for the use of growth promotion in agriculture, just keeps getting kicked down the road. Now, the FDA can do a limited amount against Congress because Congress approves its budget. But it does what it can. It can't create regulatory action. But it decides instead to enlarge the body of knowledge beyond Levy's original experiment to make sure that this is, in fact, a reproducible result and to make it very clear that their point of view, that the use of growth promoters is just not a smart thing. So they start commissioning other pieces of research. They ask the National Academies of Science to conduct a study, and in 1980, the academies say they cannot prove that growth promoters are safe. They hire the large health department that covers both Seattle and the county around it, King County, um, to conduct a study like Levy's. And once again, the result comes back that this is a reproducible result, that resistance is moving from animals given antibiotics to animals not given antibiotics to people who are consuming the animal product in this case, who are consuming chicken in the Seattle area. It asks the Institute of Medicine, and the same results keep on coming back time and time again. And while this discussion is happening in the United States without ever really any forward movement on the part of policy, without ever really any decisions, Europe, which has a quite different point of view on this, just goes ahead and bans them, just says growth promoters are not something that we are going to use here. Now, it's fair to say that Europe proceeds as a matter of public health policy on what's called the precautionary principle. If it looks like a bad idea, if it looks like a danger to human health, they are not disposed to do it, and they are willing to take action to not do those things. In the United States, we're much more likely to be empirical. We put something out there, and we see whether it, in fact, has caused a negative effect, and after that, we t maybe take action to, to control it or not. So Europe bans growth promoters partially in 99, totally in 2006. Remember those dates, because I'll come back to them in a minute. So while we're debating in the policy realm in the United States, the scientific literature about this, the exploration of what's going on when you use antibiotics in a subtherapeutic manner, not treating sick animals, but giving them to animals that are not sick, moves forward by leaps and bounds. And at this point, there are several hundred pieces of literature 
observations of various kinds, studies of various kinds, controlled experiments, that, that keep repeating what Levy found back in the 1970s. These are just a few. Um, one paper talks about a new form of the drug-resistant bacterium MRSA appearing in people, but originating in pigs with a particular resistance signature that is easily traced back not to the drugs given to people for MRSA, but to the drugs given to pigs as growth promoters. There's a multi-drug resistance factor that appears in meat and then causes infection in humans. There's a link between a particular resistant bacteria that appears in poultry meat and the very, very common infection, urinary tract infections that almost every woman on the planet has had at some point. There's attempts to calculate how many illnesses and deaths are resizing, are res, res, sorry, um, arising from this practice. And there's increasingly close molecular matches as the molecular tools get better between what's being found in the animals and what's being found in humans. But for the most part, the industry isn't moved. Now, as recently as 2009, this is what uh, 20, both um, veterinary pharma, meat production, producer groups, said to the White House Office of Science Policy in a jointly signed letter, no conclusive scientific studies. So, I'm going to guess that there are several reasons for this. The first is I think there are honest disagreements over the evidence. Um, the second is, as I mentioned, particularly down at the producer level, agriculture, meat production, is a, is a relatively low, low margin business. The, the millionaires in agriculture, for the most part, are not people who are growing chickens or pigs or cows. Um, they may be people further up the production chain. They may be people over.